Good evening and welcome to the first event of the MacFest Youth Festival. We will be hearing from young people across the UK on their thoughts about climate change and the impact it has had on their future. We hope that you enjoy their discussion. Before we hand over to the people, we'd just like to introduce ourselves. My name is Neil Johnson and this is my colleague Donna Johnson and we are the co-head teachers of Levensume High School in Manchester. We are long-standing partners of MacFest and very proud to do so, indeed hosting an event here at school this Friday, celebrating the work of Muslim poets. We're delighted to be hosting this event this evening, and now more than ever, environmental issues should be at the forth forefront of all of our th thinking. Neil and I are very excited to hear what the young people have to say. We would like to begin by thanking Dr. Mohammed Ali, who is not able to be with us this evening. He works for a company called QED and they have sponsored um, MacFest. So we'd like to give a vote of thanks to Dr. Mohammed Ali and QED. We would now like to invite our former colleague and very much valued friend, Patsy Kane OBE. Patsy, over to you. Uh, thank you. I'd also like to say um, how lovely it is to see young people from a different areas of the country. I too am really looking forward to hearing ideas and perspectives and suggestions because it is a time when we all recognise we, we need action, we need people committed to making a difference and really doing something. So um, it's going to be an interesting debate. Education's at the heart of MacFest, sharing ideas, different ideas and making sure young people are being listened to. So it's my pleasure to be here with you, with my two wonderful ex-colleagues, and um, I hope you all really enjoy the debate and get a lot out of it. Thank you. Thank you, Patsy. In a few minutes, we will be handing over to the staff at each school who will introduce their young person. We will then hear from the young people as they take it in turns to present an aspect of environmental concern that is particularly pressing to them. At the end of their presentations, they will go on to give information about how we can all support environmental matters. Now, before we begin listening to the young people, we thought we would um, set the tone of the evening by reading a poem um, by Imtiaz Darka, and the poem is called Blessing, and this poem celebrates the precious nature of drinking water. We hope you enjoy it. Blessing. The skin cracks like a pod. There never is enough water. Imagine the drip of it, the small splash, echo in a tin mug, the voice of a kindly god. Sometimes, the sudden rush of fortune, the municipal pipe bursts, silver crashes to the ground and the flow has found a roar of tongues. From the huts, a congregation, every man, woman, child, the streets around, Butts in with pots, brass, copper, aluminium, plastic buckets, frantic hands, and naked children screaming in the liquid sun. Their highlights polished to perfection, flashing light as the blessing sings over their small bones. Um, we hope you enjoyed that poem, which really does celebrate the importance of water, an, an absolute key thing for all of us. Um, it really is time for us to hand over to the young people and hear what they've got to say. So without any further ado, we'd like to hand over to Jamila Koza, who will introduce Habiba from Manchester Islamic Grammar School for Girls. Over to you, Jamila. Good evening, thank you. And Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. It's an honor for us to be here and part of this important discussion. So I want to introduce Habiba Abdul Gawad, who is a year 11 student, head girl at Manchester Islamic Grammar School for Girls. And she, um, before the times of COVID, led the whole school to take part in a climate march in, across Manchester and took part in a speech on the spot. So um, she's got really, she's really passionate about climate change. So if I pass it on to Habiba. Hello, like everyone. Okay, so I wanted to start this off because I this speech is more of a general outlook on climate change and the importance of us taking an action. Um, I want to start with a quote because Shakespeare once said, a fire that's closest kept burns most of all. Now, I think we're all fairly sure that Shakespeare wasn't a climate change activist, but his words speak volumes nevertheless. A fire that's closest kept does burn most of all. Most of all animals, 
most of all forests, most of all humans, especially when the fire is burning across our whole, our own planet, the whole of it. It's no secret that the climate crisis is, well, a crisis. We all know that, so I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. Instead, I'm here to remind you how history remembers. History remembers Shakespeare's words just as well as it's going to remember the, cri the climate crisis and, more importantly, how we respond to it. The Paris Agreement, a very important democratic document between some of the world's leading nations, and it's committing to a joint cause, the Treaty of Versailles. It's also a very important democratic document between some of the world's most important nations, also committing to a joint cause. I know you might be thinking those two things are unrelated, but they have more similarities than you might think. First of all, both were made to prevent war. The only difference is that the, Par the Paris Agreement was made to prevent war between humans and nature rather than humans and humans. Secondly, both of them failed, one more so than the other, but still. Some people believe, especially after COP26, that the Paris Agreement is working. However, an article by The Guardian has stated that every one of the world's leading economies, including all the countries that make up the G20, is failing to meet commitments made in the landmark Paris Agreement in order to stave off climate catastrophe. What does this show us? Well, firstly, maybe let's sign our important documents in Switzerland from now on. But most importantly, it also shows us that there are consequences for failure. There are, of course, the immediate consequences that we're facing right now that are predicted to worsen if we don't act. For example, the rising temperature, floods in Germany, melting Mondays in England, starving polar bears, melting ice, etc. But I feel like not enough people consider the stance history would take on such an issue, which is the main part of my speech today. I'm not asking you to look at numbers. I'm not asking you to look at graphs or pictures or statistics. In fact, I'm not asking you to look at anything at all. All I'm asking you to do is to close your eyes and imagine. Dial back the clock to the time you were my age. Now let's imagine that instead of 2022 is the year 2300, which coincidentally is the year some experts are predicting New York City is going to go underwater if we carry on with our climate change at the current rate. You now let's go back to you. Let's focus on you. You're in a school trip at a museum. You see all the expected things, Egyptian temples, Roman tablets, Greek pillars, but then you walk to a display. It's kind of empty to begin with empty enough for your own voice to echo throughout. But you see a glass case shining with a gentle blue light. You take a look, it's a picture, underwater buildings, and you can just about make out the Statue of Liberty. You're not surprised. You're seeing the lost city of New York, not Atlantis, a real place, not a myth. You knew people who lived there. You walk further down to the extinct animals exhibition. Yes, yes, you see the dodos and the mammoths and saber-toothed tigers, but you also see polar bears and Asian elephants some of the animals most at risk of extinction. Maybe you're not even on Earth anymore. Maybe you're on Mars. I mean, it is 2300 after all. You can't see it, but you know where to look to see a faint blue dot, Earth. Only it's not blue anymore. It's a faint red dot. It's a planet on fire because just like Shakespeare said, a fire that's closest kept does burn most of all. I think I can speak for most of us here when I say that even though I told you to imagine, you probably were not able to. Why? because it seems fantastical. It seems unreal to imagine something like that. And luckily, we still have a chance to keep it that way, to keep it unreal. And that's why we're here today, to discuss how to battle climate change. We all know about our targets of net zero emissions by 2050, less deforestation, more reforestation, more recycling. And I'm sure other people on this panel have a lot to say about how to, how to battle climate change. But I'm here because I wanted to remind you about why we're battling climate change why it's important for everyone living currently and yet to be born that we stop this now. Because after all, if the climate can change, then why can't we? Within these seven years, we have the one and only chance to for real this time ensure peace in our time. Thank you. Thank you, Habiba. Um, that was powerfully evocative, hauntingly prophetic and skillfully constructed as an exposition on the potential um, dangers that we face unless we act immediately. So we really do appreciate your comments there. Thank you. Um, we would now like to hand over to Tasneem and Tasneem's mum. So if I can, who, and Tasneem is from Camp Hill School for Girls in Birmingham. So over to you, Tasneem's mum, to introduce Tasneem. Uh, okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Khalida Al Safi, Tasneem's mother, Tasneem's mother, uh, and I'm delighted to introduce my daughter who will share her views on the topic of climate change. Enjoy it. Thank you. Um, good evening, all. Uh, my name is Tasneem Sadiq. As pre previously mentioned, I'm a student at Camp Hill Grammar School for Girls in Birmingham, and it's extremely valuable that everyone here is taking time today to discuss the topic of climate change. I'll be exploring the impact it's having on our planet, but particularly the repercussions it's having on our lives as individuals living in this country today. Now, we've probably all heard about climate change, it, along with global warming, greenhouse gases and pollution have all become buzzwords in the media being used to describe the devastating visible impacts we humans are having on the earth. We are faced every day with overwhelming amounts of information regarding this serious topic. News articles speak of the carbon emission levels, social media platforms bombard us with photographs of endangered animals and documentaries portray the horrors of natural disasters induced by climate change. Now these catastrophic problems but we don't dwell on them for long. We adopt a laissez-faire attitude where there's a presumption that if we put all of our issues on the back burner, they'll somehow magically disappear. Moreover, at the forefront of our battle against this global crisis, we have lazy politicians making empty promises and formulating deluded targets instead of being proactive in their plans. So I appeal to you, cooperating members of our society, to begin evaluating your everyday choices and taking charge in this fight to defend our planet. Here in the UK, we're not as directly subject to the effects of climate change as people in countries around the world. This is a fact. We don't have wildfires, deforestation is hardly an issue for us, and air pollution does not have as many harmful implications on our health. But why should we have to wait to hear our planet's cries for help before we come to its rescue? If, however, you still require proof that we're damaging our country in particular, simply observe the rise in accounts of flooding in the UK over the past few years. One source states that there is a 10% chance of a catastrophic flood happening in England within the next two decades, causing an excess of 10 billion pounds in damage. Consider those numbers. Furthermore, hotter summers, they might be nice for a barbecue or to get the swimming pool out. But what we don't realize is that dry climate is having a devastating effect on the yield of agriculture. And finally, UK winters are projected to become warmer and wetter on average. Now, you might be thinking, what does all these, do all these things have to do with me? As of right now, we're experiencing small, insignificant changes to our lives. But as time progresses, the culmination of these issues will begin to manifest in our lives. For example, it might result in energy price increases due to a high demand for air conditioning units and fans in the summer. Food shortages may occur as a result on, of, of the effect on the agriculture. These and many more effects these and many more effects of climate change will become visible over the years, but they will most heavily impact the youth today. And that is why we are at the forefront of this discussion. Can you imagine your own grandchildren and great grandchildren are highly unlikely to ever experience snow as a result of our careless actions? Now, these facts and figures might sound extremely daunting and scary, but we must all realize that it is not too late to salvage our planet. Huge energy companies are beginning to adopt greener sources of energy. Giant corporate companies such as Amazon are striving towards carbon neutral statuses. And scientists are innovating methods such as carbon capture and release to reverse air pollution. Now you don't have to be a multi-million pound company or a world renowned scientist to contribute to the effort. On the contrary, in order to achieve our aim, everyone should begin to make changes to the way we treat our planet and pull their weight. Start today by eating those leftovers in the fridge rather than contributing to food waste. Or if you're feeling cold, consider layering up rather than always having the heating on. Try not to drive everywhere, maybe walk to school or walk to work tomorrow. Do you see how quick and easy these things are to do? And you can do them from the comfort of your own home at little to no cost. Our own religion, Islam, teaches its followers to take care of the earth. Muslims believe that humans should act as guardians or khalifa of the planet and that we should be held accountable by God for our actions. There are over 500 verses in the Holy Quran which deal with the natural phenomenon and Allah the Almighty repeatedly calls on mankind to reflect on creations which include all aspects of nature such as trees, mountain, seas, mountains, seas and animals. For this reason we must honour Allah's beautiful creation and follow his teachings. We can also look to our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as the perfect role model. He once said that the act of removing a harmful thing from the path is a charitable act. 
From this, we can infer that we have been instructed to maintain a habitable and pleasant environment for others and ourselves, and stopping climate change is the perfect way to achieve this goal. So in conclusion, despite the looming threat of this global crisis, if we take action now, we can begin to slow its effect and secure a wonderful future on this planet for others, so they can enjoy it the same way that we have for all these years. For, all, for more information on ways to reduce your carbon footprint, visit greenpeace.org.uk and start saving our planet today. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tasnim. What an absolute superstar you are. Your mum must be sat next to you feeling incredibly um, proud. Utterly compelling. I could have listened to you. We could have listened to you for hours talking so, so passionately. I think one of the things for me is how beautifully you've captured the call to, call to action because you write when you say that we see the images and we're, we're, we're like overloaded with images and discussion and talk about the politician and their lack of lack of action on this. If only all of our politicians were so so eloquent, Tasnim. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you to Tasnim's mum. And it gives us it gives us great pleasure to introduce um, a Manchester school uh, schoolgirl. Isla from uh, Cedar Mount Academy. So, Isla, are you with us? Uh, so, Aslamu alaikum. Uh, like Miss said, that I'm from Cedar Mount Academy, and my name is Isla. And uh, I would first of all like to say thank you for everyone for inviting me today. I've never done a talk like this before, and therefore I'm honoured to be doing it. Um, I've split my presentation into three parts so that our audience can fully grasp what I'm trying to say since climate change is such a big topic. I split it into our future, our curriculum and our solutions. So with that, I shall begin. Our future. What does that mean to you? It may mean world peace or stopping homelessness. It may mean something as simple as growing old and watching the sunset. And that's what I used to think until I opened my eyes to the real world. The truth is we won't have a future if by the time we reach that stage, all that will be left is a wasteland full of our ancestors' mistakes. We won't get to be doctors and explorers and even teachers if by that time there's nothing left on this earth that we can take. And it's not as simple as holding hands and singing about nature. Because those who have power, like Joe Biden, Vladimir Putin, and Xi Jinping, deny any responsibility of having any effect whatsoever. And in fact, they have the audacity to blame it on each other for their mistake. So instead, it's up to us to change fear. However, not everyone is as bad, cruel, and selfish as them. We have beings and so many activists that help, like Malaika Vaz and Little Nadia, who are trying to reverse what looks like to be a disastrous future. In CMA, we've actually been learning about the Malaysian rainforest recently. And in my opinion, this ties in really well with this topic. The Malaysian rainforest, which is the second biggest producer of palm oil after Indonesia, has a deforestation rate at around 34%, which makes sense in a way since they are the second exporter of palm oil. However, 80% of the deforestation is due to logging, which is needed to match the high demands in meat and the steady population growth. An example of this is from 1956 to 1980, where 15,000 hectares of land was used for migrants. And this is really bad in this case, as it means the loss of trees, it means that soil erosion which happen, will happen. And in future, this means a higher rate of desertification. And it's not only Malaysia, there's places like Australia, the Maldives is also being covered with water, and even the UK. The UK is facing so much change from climate change, and no one even notices it because it's normally a wet land. Um, what do you call it? <laughs> the CO2 is being released back into the atmosphere due to uh, deforestation. However, although we are rapidly approaching the tipping point, we still have some hope as we have adaptation and mitigation solutions. 
which might save us from this calamity. Some of these include selective logging, afforestation, education, ecotourism, and international agreements. These strategies may help us reduce the amount of damage we're doing, but it's not enough. And the truth is we should leave these beautiful landscapes to flourish and thrive. Thank you for your time. Either thank you so much. Um, it, was, it was absolutely great to hear from you. And um, Miss Johnson and I will make a point of making sure we email your head teacher tomorrow just to say um, how wonderfully well you've just spoken um, this evening to us all. And I just want to pick out a couple of things that, I, um, that, that really resonate with me from that. And firstly, I think it's about those timely reminder about this is not about casting blame. We cannot spend our time pointing our fingers at others, but rather we need to hold some mirrors up to ourselves and think about what action we can take um, in order to support um, environmental concerns. You then also talked about the importance of education, and that's absolutely what this evening is all about. Um, educating each other, learning those key important bits of information about what's happening around the world and you've played your part in doing that splendidly. And finally, you talked about the idea of hope and absolutely there is of course hope because without that we're paralysed and you've made sure the clear message goes forward that there is still hope and we can act on that and move forward. So absolutely thank you very much Isla for that. Um, okay, I'd now like to hand over to um, Dan Farr, um, who is going to introduce Fuad uh, from the Manchester Grammar School. Dan, are you with us this evening? Uh, hi there. Um, unfortunately, Mr Farr um, can't make it. Um, he's, he's had um, certain things that he has to do at school. So, um, yeah, my name is Saeed Fuad Jaffrey. Um, I study at the Manchester Grammar School here in Manchester. Um, so, yeah, inshallah, I'll give my talk. So. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wal Aqibatul Muttaqeen Nabiina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in The past few years and decades have seen unprecedented changes to our environment and the effects on the organisms residing within it. I quote the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment published in 2005 backed, over, backed by over 1,300 scientists from 95 countries where it was found and I quote overall people have made greater changes to ecosystems in the last half of the 20th century than at any other time in human history. These changes have enhanced human well-being, but have been accompanied by ever-increasing degradation for our environment." End quote. This assessment was done over 15 years ago. What has been done since? <clears throat> Eight out of the top 10 warmest years ever recorded on our planet occurred in the last decade, as was pointed out by NASA. The past few years have seen the mighty river Euphrates drying up and is said will run completely dry within the next two decades unless action is taken. Our dear Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam predicted in a, in a hadith the hour will not come to pass before the river Euphrates dries up. With more hot days and heat waves, with more severe storms and flooding, with increased droughts and lack of water, Islam has guidelines on how mankind can continue utilizing the resources of this earth without exhausting them, nor corrupting the environment in which he lives. The view of Muslims on this vast universe is that it is a, it is a display of divine perfect qualities and a product of Allah's perfect design. The relationship of Muslims with nature should be that of friendship and care, not negligence and abuse. It should be that of stewardship, not ownership. As Muslims, we should regard care for the environment as our sacred duty. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fashioned and created Adam alayhi salam, he gave this responsibility to humanity when he said in the Quran, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً Remember when your Lord said to the angels, I am going to place a khalifa, a successive authority, a, su a successive steward on, the, on earth. The notion of stewardship is directly linked with the concept of amana, of trust. The creation which resides on this earth depends on us as Muslims and us as humans. Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, تُسَبِّحُ لَهُ السَّمَاوَاتُ السَّبْعُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَا فِيهِنْ وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ وَلَكِنْ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ The seven heavens, the earth, and whatever is within them glorify him. There's not a single thing except it glorifies Allah with praise. Well, you simply cannot comprehend their way of glorification. 
He is indeed most forbearing, all forgiven. Allah Azza wa Jal also says, All living beings, roaming the earth and winged birds soaring in the sky, are communities like yourselves. Having this mindset, understand, understanding the honor of the environment and the ecosystems around us, knowing they praise Allah just as we do, though we may not understand how, knowing Allah blessed us with this earth and has gifted us the beauty of this earth and its resources, will not only prevent us from, prevent us from harm, harming the natural world, but will also cause us to treat and attend to it. An example of attending to nature and the living creatures was mentioned by the Prophet Muhammad. One aspect I want us to focus is what the simple action was and what the consequent was. Abu Huraira radiallahu anh, narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, while a man was walking on his way, he became extremely thirsty. He found a well. He went down into it to drink water. Upon leaving it, he saw a dog that was panting out of thirst. His tongue was hanging out and he was eating moist earth from extreme thirst. The man thought to himself, this dog is extremely thirsty as I was. So he descended into the well, filled up his leather sock with water and holding it with his teeth, climbed up and quenched the thirst of the dog. Thus Allah forgave him in appreciation for his action and admitted him into paradise. The companions of the Prophet asked, shall we be rewarded for showing kindness to the animals also? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a reward is given in connection with every living creature. Merely for quenching the thirst of a dog, the man was admitted into paradise. As a direct result of fulfilling the role of stewardship on earth, the man's deeds were forgiven. Not only should living creatures expect and deserve protection, not only should we attend to the issues facing the environment, but we should also seek the benefits the natural world has to offer. Secondly, the Quran and Sunnah of the, of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches, teaches moderation in all aspects of life, of which is the consumption of resources. Addressing mankind, he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bani Adam, khudu zinatukum inda kulli masjid, wa kulu wa shrabu wa la tusrifu, innahu la yuhibbu al-musrifin. O children of Adam, wear your beautiful apparel at every time and place of worship. Eat and drink, but do not waste by excess. Surely, he does not like the wasteful. Moderation is a key concept in the Islamic tradition. We are taught not to waste water when purifying ourselves in preparation for prayer. We are taught by the Prophet that when we eat, we eat so that one third of the available, st available space in our stomachs is for food, another third for water and drinks, and the final third for air. We are taught to have a balance between the worship of our Lord and spending time with our families. Moderation continues when, when speaking about consuming Earth's resources. The scholars of usul, of, legal, of Islamic legal theory, agree on a principle that states, repelling harms takes precedence over reaping benefits. The moderation of benefiting from what Earth has to offer and ensuring minimal damage is done as a result is root, rooted in the Islamic tradition. However, we have, failed to, we have failed to live up to the teachings of our Lord and his messenger. Finally, this is where we pay heed to those who know how to tackle this sub, substantial complication. We should take on board the advice given by experts and scientists who know far better how to attend to the issues the environment is facing and how we can ultimately fulfill our role as trustees on this earth. Allah, Allah Azza wa says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ then ask those who know, who have knowledge, if you do not know. Allah commands us as Muslims to consult those who know particular fields when exploring those fields. We as young Muslims living in the 21st century are treading into uncharted waters. Our case, in our case, we should spend time educating ourselves on how we can make a difference, using the advice of scientists and activists and taking them on board. With little changes to our daily lives, maximum benefits can be reaped for not only our future selves and, but also, uh, uh, and those who will live on this earth, but entire ecosystems alike. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fuad. That was so beautifully presented. 
with some really clear research-based links between our responsibilities as human beings, our responsibilities as Muslims and followers of, of other religions, and just the, you know, the, the link between the facts and the, the um, responsibility that we all have to make sure that we're playing our part. It was a, a beautiful presentation throughout. And Mr. Farr has joined us. He is in the, he is in the in the meeting. So it would be lovely to hear from him, not to put him on the spot, but just to hear from somebody who knows you better than we do about how proud he, he also is of you. You here? Yes, absolutely. Have you can you hear me okay? Excellent. My apologies for, for running late uh, and therefore not even knowing whether the technology uh, is working. It seems to be. Um, yeah, I, I, I suspect uh, Fuad has um, portrayed through the talk, which I just caught the tail end of, um, much more about himself than I can actually do with a few words of, of commendation. I would just say about Fuad, he joined the school at the start of uh, at the start of year 12. So he's been with us for a relatively short amount of time, given that we go all the way back down to year two. Um, and we have very substantial numbers of Muslim pupils in the school. Uh, all of whom, uh, or many of whom, I would say, are really keen to uh, serve the school on its ISOC committee. And actually, um, for, for Fuad to arrive in the school so recently and impress people so much that he, he made his way onto the ISOC committee, I think, well, I think you've probably seen the reasons why. Um, I think the, the, the one thing I'd really commend Fuad for is just how selflessly he gives his time uh, and has a real passion for Islamic education. Um, and this is really evident in terms of the education that he's uh, he's doing on uh, some of the early leaders of Islam to the Muslim community in school. But in particular, what he's done um, for the first time ever is open um, is is uh, open Friday prayers to some of our junior school boys who would like to start uh, engaging in Friday prayers, even though you know, it's not a, a religious obligation on them. Um, and Fuad has facilitated that and he prepares every week a short, really age appropriate talk to really help nurture some of our younger children in their religious faith. Uh, so he's been a he's been a great asset to our school. And, and I'm sure uh, you all got a lot from his from his talk this evening. And my apologies that I, uh, I wasn't here for all of it. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for those for those kind words. Um, and thank you to all four of the young people for what they have shared with us so far. And they have been searingly honest in their evaluation of what is happening in the world at the minute. What we would like to give them the opportunity to do now, just for a short time back to each of them in the order that they have, um, have presented to us in, is just to, to give us some ideas of possible solutions positive things that we can do and think uh, think of together going forwards. Um, not for a, a great deal of time, just a, a minute or so, um, just to share your ideas about the solutions. So Habiba, if you're okay to, for us to hand over to you first. Hi, okay. Um, so I've been thinking about this because obviously we know the, the global measures we're taking that I discussed before about how there's the 2050 net zero emissions target and the everything that went on in COP26. Um, our school right now is, we have um, eco warriors where each form has a girl who's has like a plan that she has to look after, that's the side thing. But also we have them taking part in climate conferences um, facilitated by our geography teacher, Ms. Sparker, who discusses like the climate, uh, the impacts of climate change and what you can do personally to like reduce its impact from recycling so that you can do at home that we already know but it's like because most of the girls know what to do they're just being encouraged to keep up with it more thank you thank you Habiba. thanks Habiba. i think an important thing that you've just referenced there is being taught how to do these things i think um uh, many of you have referenced that we are overwhelmed with um, information about the devastating impact of lots of our actions, but perhaps few of us are clear on what practical things we can actually do. And the power of education is just that, showing each other what we can do, albeit perhaps on quite a small scale, but nonetheless, lots of little things can add up to big whole, can't they? So, um, yeah, really important to thank you for sharing that. If um, we can come to you now, Tasneem, please. 
Um, hi, yeah. Um, so as mentioned, uh, when I spoke before, I think the most vital part of fighting the climate crisis is the small acts that we can all participate in every single day. So um, for, in reference to Habiba's Eco Warriors scheme that they had at their school, we had, um, I think the National Trust was running something where um, people were planting trees. So our school signed up for that. They planted trees. There's things like um, just small investments that you make day to day whether it's actual like financial investments in say for example an electric car or a more um environmentally friendly tv or a more water efficient washing machine or whether it's a time investment like walking to school instead of catching the bus or instead of taking the car or just finding just small ways i think day to day which will accumulate and help us to kind of cultivate a solid and robust plan to move us past the climate crisis and hopefully solve the climate crisis, I think. Thank you for that, Tasneem. Um, I think it's interesting that you've mentioned both Greenpeace and the National Trust um, this evening in the few minutes that you've been talking. And there are so many, and one of the, the important jobs that schools must do is also make young people aware of these organisations, because some young people in our schools may not know um, what the National Trust do or what Greenpeace are. There are hundreds of organisations that support this type of work. So along with, as you would reference them, the, the small things that everybody could do that are really important. It's also the education, isn't it, that, that backs that up. So, so thanks for raising those points, Tasnin. Um, Ayla, if we can come back to you. Uh, yeah, like Ms. Johnson said, I think one of the biggest things we can do right now is educate the future generations because we are going to get this planet one day and if we don't know exactly what to do with it, if we don't know the ways we can stop damaging it, then it can't thrive and do exactly what it needs to do. It can't produce natural resources, it can't you know, it will decrease in biodiversity, many animals may be extinct. And I feel like if education is given to those who are going to take the planet, then we will know how to look after it. And you're absolutely spot on. And it perhaps will come as no surprise to hear from um, two co-head teachers and teachers that education, education, education is definitely what this is all about. And certainly making sure that you young people and your voices are heard as often as they can. And you taking your voices and the power of that back into your schools and making sure that as many people as possible understand from some really thorough research that you've all done um, and then those practical strategies absolutely key and then finally we could come to you for that um yeah i was going to give a more of a um, islamic viewpoint um i mean in, in terms of um like practical solutions as muslims um and many of us can relate to this um if not all um, muslims is that concept of wudu um, when purifying ourselves um, in preparation for prayer. Now, in this situation, many people uh, might overdo it when, when washing themselves with the hands, the arms, the face, and so on. Um, but, you know, the Prophet وسلم, only used around half a litre when doing um, wudu, and he was very, very um, efficient um, when it comes to um, purifying himself and whatnot. So I think this can translate and we can extrapolate not only in, in purifying ourselves, but that includes you know, um, excess food or excess, even paper when we use paper, and especially at schools, uh, growing up, um, we always used recycled paper and we re reuse paper, scrap paper. Um, and I think this is a, a very, it's, a, it's an Islamic concept that's rooted um, in, our, in our tradition. Um, also, like I said, the, the concept of um, using excess in general, um, Allah says, in Allah al Musrifin, um, he doesn't like the ones who are excessive um, and that's also that's and, and, and like I said, it goes throughout our entire lives, um, including food. But another thing that another practical sense, um, and and this applies to everybody, is is you know planting planting plants, planting trees, um, because the prophet said that you know the the benefits, and I'm summarizing here, the benefits of planting trees to the other to to animals or humans that walk by it, you will get good deeds for it they may sit down under the shade of it, they may reap the fruits of it. Um, and I think this is, you know, if you're talking merely on a, on a selfish sense in that, in that case, um, you can definitely benefit. Um, but overall, the, the big, big idea is, is you know, the, the little things we can do, which doesn't affect our lifestyles um, too drastically. 
Thank you for that, Fuad. It's really interesting to hear the example of preparation for, for prayer, um, but then also to hear the links back to some of the, the bigger things that every single human being um, can, can be responsible for, for um, making sure that they're doing themselves. And as we come into spring, and I think we're all looking forward, aren't we, to a little bit more daylight and seeing some of those um, flowers blooming. I think the idea of, of planting things and seeing things grow is one that it's very relatable to, for everybody, isn't it? From very young children right through to, to adulthood. So, so thank you for those reflections, Stuart. Um, we would now like to hand back over to um, Kazra Shiraz, thanking everybody for their wonderful contributions. We have once again been utterly inspired by the intelligence, the thoughtfulness, the consideration, and um, how articulate each young person is. Um, so thank you for what's been a very enjoyable evening from Donna and I. Kezra. Thank you so much, Neil and Donna. That was absolutely marvellous event. I cannot help but congratulate all of you. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm just so impressed by the whole thing. First of all, I want to thank you two for doing a marvellous job that you always do. And then, of course, thank you, our amazing panellists. My goodness, aren't they confident? Aren't they knowledgeable? Uh, they've got so much to teach us and I've learned so much and you're going to be the amazing ambassador for environment, for climate change, for the future as we can see. And you have put your schools, your teachers, your heads, your parents on the map of MacFest, but also made them incredibly proud. So it, it's just been an honor to host all of you. I want to thank De Patsy, our <laughs> staunch supporter of MacFest from day one, who always presides over this. And of course, I want to thank the amazing teachers and the heads who have given their time to connect us to their student, to answer that email, to be here for this event and for the rehearsal. Without you guys, we couldn't have done it. So I'm sure you are incredibly proud, all of you, you uh, for your um, students performance this evening and thank you finally to all our audience who are here today thank you for joining us because I know you're giving your time this is a meal time and yet you're with us so I'm really grateful our team is grateful for your time two announcements one is this event we've got this Saturday please please do join us this is an event, generic event for Islamic artifacts in the museum, 12 o'clock on Saturday. And then a reminder, today's event was a special event. Why? It's the first event of the youth festival. We have kicked off the youth festival with this event. We've got three others coming your way, one on poetry. Amazing students will read their poetry, share with us. Another event, international and national cultural heritage where students from USA and from Indonesia and England will share about their cultural heritage. And then you guys were amazing. Well, wait and watch the four students from around the world, from Indonesia, India, Germany and England share their views. So please do join us for that as well. And finally, thank you. Goodbye, good evening, and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.